All right, well, I guess we'll get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and hope you're having a lovely holiday season. Welcome to today's presentation in the Kirk 2022 webinar series entitled Food Recovery and Composting on Campus. I'm Jennifer Maxwell, and I'm the Sustainability Program Director at Appalachian State University in Boone, North Carolina. Um, I'm a member of the Marketing and Programs Committee of Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition, and I um, recently stepped down after seven years on the board, so I've been a part of Kirk for quite a while. Um, thank you for joining us, and I'll be moderating the session today. Um, for those of you not familiar with Kirk, the College and University Recycling Coalition is a member-based organization that works to grow collegiate recycling and waste reduction efforts by fostering technical information exchange, educational support, and networking opportunities between the staff, faculty, and student leaders implementing diversion programs. Today's session is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational and educational topics related to the collegiate recycling and sustainable materials management. Today's program is the sixth and last webinar in our 2022 series. We have a few housekeeping notes I'll go over. So if you have any problems with your audio or video during the webinar, you can visit Zoom Support Center by visiting zoom.support.us. To avoid background noise, we've placed everyone but the panelists lines on mute. We encourage you to submit the questions at any time using the Q&A section to type us a note. And um, we'll read many, as many of these as possible out loud at the end of the presentations. We'll try to, we've built in some time for Q&A. Um, for general comments or notes, use the chat function in the dashboard. And then copies of today's presentation slides will be available to download and a recording available to stream within the next day or so from the Kirk website, www.kirk3r.org. Okay, now to the topic at hand. Um, reducing food waste through recovery, donation, and composting addresses major systemic concerns, including climate change and food insecurity. Join our expert panelists as they discuss approaches and solutions to these issues through educational programs, operations, and community partnerships to reclaim organic material and recover meals through a variety of programs. First up, I am pleased to introduce Linda Norris Walt with the US Composting Council to begin with a few words from our sponsor. So thank you, Linda, for being here. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm really glad to be here. Um, we really have enjoyed working with Kirk over the years. You all do such good work. And I'm really happy to see how strongly campuses have come back since COVID um, when it comes to this um, organics collection space. Uh, we were doing a lot of work with Kirk until the pandemic shut everything down, and I saw all the pain that you all went through. So we do love our campus members of USCC um, who join either as single academic members or as campus department members, and we even created a department membership that allows you to have two free student memberships along with your professional memberships, since I know students provide a lot of your composting power. And I also wanna mention, I'm gonna put in the chat that we have a campus composting manual that was produced the year before COVID. And the full manual is free to our members and an executive summary is available to non-members. And I'll, like I said, I'll put the link in the chat. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that our conference is in California in January. And especially if there are students on this call, for students, we offer a 65% discount off our entry price. So we'd love to have students at the conference. So many students are going into this area now. It's exciting to see. So thank you to Kirk for the opportunity to be here. And I can't wait to hear what the speakers have to say today. Great, thank you so much, Linda, and to US Composting Council for the sponsorship and the continued partnership. We really appreciate you all so much. Okay, now I would like to, hold on. Here we go with slide issues again. Okay, I would like to introduce our first set of speakers, Marie Davis with Aramark and Joe Sullivan with New Hanover County. 
Marie Davis was born and raised in North Carolina and grew up in the Piedmont, but traded the red clay for the sandier soils of the Lower Cape Fear when she pursued her BA in elementary education with a minor in psychology at UMCW. After several years in formal education, she made the leap to environmental education with a focus on sustainability and returned to UNCW to complete an MS in environmental studies. Marie is a sustainability professional, educator, and farmer with a personal passion and professional focus on food waste minimization, single-use plastics reduction, and food systems change. Through her role at Aramark, she engages with both operators, consumers, and clients around Aramark's Be Well, Do Well sustainability strategy to support implementation, drive progress against Aramark's planet priorities, and inspire innovation. Prior to her time with Aramark, Marie's professional career included diverse experiences centered on sustainability and education in the nonprofit, government, and private sectors. She is a founding member and the current chair for the Coastal Composting Council, a regional committee of the North Carolina Composting Council. In her free time, Marie's passionate about teaching others the many benefits of growing one's own food, particularly in closing the loop from seed to fork to waste. When her hands are not in the dirt, she can be found playing at the beach, camping, kayaking, and cooking up a storm, generally with her trusty canine shadow Chevy. So welcome, Marie, and I'll go ahead and introduce Joe as well, because the two of them will be tag teaming the presentation. So Joe Sullivan joined New Hanover County in 2012 after eight years in the private sector operating hauling companies, landfills, and MRFs. He leads the Recycling and Solid Waste Department, which includes a subtitle D Landfill, Household Hazardous Waste, Recycling, and Litter Management Divisions. Welcome, Marie and Joe. I'm going to switch the slides here for you really quickly. Thanks, Jen. Sorry to give you a novel to read for me. <laughs> no problem. Great stuff going on for you, Marie. So glad you're here. Thanks for having me. All right. All right, I can see I'm still seeing the slides for today's webinar panel. Okay, let me do this, stop and then reshare screen. Let's try that. Success. Great, thanks. All right, well, Jen addressed that. Um, so Joe and I are gonna talk today really about um, how a grassroots education and advocacy group, um, local government, a university, and a third party food service provider partnered together to bring composting to New Hanover County, North Carolina. So um, New Hanover County is on the southernmost Cape of North Carolina. Um, a coastal county uh, that is surrounded um, by a lot of ag land. All right. You can Oops. Oh, say it's not too. Um, so really this effort started, it honestly dates back before 2015, but that's really when it started gaining traction. Um, the Coastal Composting Council came together as a group of folks that were interested in bringing composting to Wilmington, uh, North Carolina, which at the time did not have a composting facility. And if you kind of look at the background of that map there, the closest facility um, was nearly 60 miles away. So it didn't really make sense um, to be sending compost there, but it was a solution um, that was very desirable and wanted for this community. Um, so the really cool part about this, and it's great to have Linda on the call today, is that um, this group connected with some additional members and really just the traction really kicked in when we went to the North Carolina Compost Council, which is part of the US Compost Council's annual member meeting um, in June of 2015. And, and this group actually now is, um, as Jen mentioned, affiliated with the North Carolina Composting Council with the first regional committee. I'll go to my next slide. So really the early efforts of this group revolved around educating 
education and advocacy um, since the creation in 2015. We've hosted a number of different workshops. Um, the Big Tent was actually uh, at environmental management at the landfill site. Uh, we've done work in schools. We partnered with a variety of agencies um, that I'll expand upon later. Um, but really all with the ultimate goal of trying to bring composting through whatever solution that we could come up with um, to our, our county. So if we go to the next slide. And, and this is really where we wanted to highlight today the power of partnership was form. So at the time, um, I was working at UNCW um, and with the Chief Sustainability Officer there um, at the time, Kat Pullman, um, her and I were brainstorming together and happened to know Joe here on the call and realized that the three of us, you know, we had the food waste, we had the desire. He also had, you know, the landfill um, and, and the space that could be permitted to do so and, and the want to keep organics out of there. And so with the powers of all that combined, I'll let Joe walk you through the process, but we're able to bring a composting solution to our county. Um, but they're really, pivotal part of this is that it wasn't just, you know, the four partners listed here. Um, you know, we worked with the Composting Council, North Carolina Environmental Quality, the Cooperative Extension, Soil and Water. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Wilmington Compost Company in a minute that was formed as a result of this effort. Um, New Hanover County and the county commissioners and our school system all have been powerful partners in this effort. Um, so I'm going to the next slide here. And I'll turn it over to Joe here, and he can talk a little bit about sort of the, the first big project and the culmination of all those partners and efforts uh, via Project Huckleberry. Yeah, so so thank you all, um, one, for the invitation, and Jennifer, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> Huckleberry is, uh, I guess, the nickname we've given to the project when we're referring to our compost operation. Um, so if you could bear with me there on that, uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So what really drove the desire was um, one, you know, campus dining um, at UNCW, they have what's called the Wagner Dining Hall um, and their desire to achieve zero, uh, zero waste or waste free status. Uh, so that was the primary driver behind it um, for for our department. Um, operating the landfill, we do routine internal waste audits where we will select a, uh, a roll-off truck or a front-load truck or a residential truck, and we'll literally sort through um, the waste that we receive and, and uh, put it, break it out in ratios and weigh it and get a better idea of what it is that's coming into the site. And we were kind of shocked at how much compostable material was coming in um, and, and it was just it, it was just a, a no brainer for us to try to divert as much as that waste as possible. And really just the fantastic group of people we had with the Coastal Composting Council uh, generating the awareness and getting uh, the community excited about uh, our efforts to move forward with putting in some type of commercial composting facility right here in our county. Next slide, please. So it wasn't easy. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna sugarcoat the process. Um, starting up a commercial compost facility is not something you can knock out in six months or even a year. So, as Marie mentioned, um, you know, I got the initial outreach from them, um, the ask from them, way back in 2015. Um, they assisted us immensely with helping to put together our application for the permit, which of course um, has to be done through uh, North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality or NCDEQ. Uh, we did get the um, permit uh, application approved back in the first part of 2016. So, so really we're, we're talking about um, six to eight months at this point from idea to just getting the permit approved, but then you have to get into acquisition. And as you know, any level of government, you have bid processes to go through, you have to get contracts approved. It's not as easy as going uh, you know, to a website and ordering a piece of equipment, paying for it and have it delivered a few weeks later. Uh, so we did um, go through the uh, requisition process and the competitive bidding process. 
And uh, once the equipment was delivered, uh, you're looking at, um, you know, the latter part of 2017 before we finally commissioned the, uh, the system. And it was actually the day after Thanksgiving in November of 2017. Um, we had a ramp up period where we were training staff. Uh, and then it really went full blown, getting the word out because we didn't want to have this fantastic product out there and nobody uh, was even aware that we had it. It actually took quite a bit of time um, from the time we operated, uh, started operation of the equipment before we got our full blown operating permit. So it was late in 2018 before we received that. And then by then the word had gotten out and we were running full blast. There were actually periods of time where we were struggling to get enough food waste to keep Huckleberry uh, in full operation, but we got pretty creative with um, reaching out to folks, um, everything from collecting pumpkins after Halloween to going to um, local fruit and vegetable vendors, going to farmers markets and taking away their leftover scrap materials. And once word got out, uh, it really traveled quickly and it really was an innovative system. And then we started receiving awards, and it, and I don't say that to to toot our collective horns. I say that because that increased even more awareness. So it was kind of like the self fulfilling prophecy in that uh, the more word got out, the more uh, interest there was, and then people started talking about it. And now um, we're at the point where you know we can't make it fast enough. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just. I've touched on some of the results, but some of these are just really um, important to stress. There's so many additional benefits to just having a compost operation. Um, the the uh, Coastal Composting Council really helped drive local interest in it. And so people started looking at themselves and saying, how do I reduce the amount of compostable waste? And it's not just food waste. It's everything from paper and cardboard and um, you know other compostable materials. Uh, and we have seen uh, the education efforts are really starting to to make make an impact. Uh, I know my numbers there are, are way old. Uh, I'm sure they're well past 100 tons of food waste that just campus dining alone has diverted away from landfill disposal. Um, one of the really surprise benefits of this was the creation of a uh, a startup company. It's not a startup company anymore, I can tell you that, um, but uh, it, it just basically came from the simple question, hey, this is a great program, but I, I don't want to drive all the way out to the landfill to take my three or four pounds of, of rotten bananas. Uh, so uh, an entrepreneur started up the Wilmington Compost Company uh, where they were collecting food scraps from people's front porches, and then that grew into restaurants, and and now you know he's got several employees and and several hundred customers in that. So that was a, a very positive unintended outcome from this project. Um, but really, what makes uh, me so proud of this program is that uh, to date we've already had 700 tons of free commercial grade compost has been given out to the public and not just here in New Hanover County, but in the surrounding counties as well. So the next slide will show you kind of a little bit of what Huckleberry looks like. Next slide, please. Sorry, I'm having a technical difficulty. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I don't know why my computer does not like to advance slides. You're building anticipation. <laughs> Man, what does Huckleberry look like? <laughs> All right, let me see. Here we go. Can you see that? Yes. Now? Okay, yeah. great. So um, Huckleberry is, is basically an in-vessel composting system. Um, what The reason why we really... Um, like this type of system is, is we've got space constraints. Some other places don't, but we have space constraints. It's a very small county. It's a very small site. And um, we were able to get this in vessel composter system on a footprint of 80 feet by 90 feet. Uh, and this system was originally designed to process cow manure, and it was very effective at doing so. 
but the company was also interested in, in our questions, which is, hey, can it process food waste as well? So it was really a, a, a corporate slash government um, uh, collaboration, if you will, to, to pilot this type of equipment for that specific use that it really wasn't designed for. Just real quick on the far end, on the left side of the picture, you can see the mixer and then the eight foot diameter by nine or um, uh, uh, 40 foot long insulated uh, in vessel composter unit. And then the silver part at the end to our right is uh, the screen. And then you got to take off conveyor with the with the um, the material that comes out after it's been screened. Now, from there, it just goes to a curing bunkers, which would be to the left of the of the picture there. Um, and so the beauty of this type of system versus a, a static pile type system or even a backyard composting system is we can get a compost that's fully cured and ready to go to the public in about 35 to 40 days. Next slide, please. Awesome. Um, so really, you know, we've learned a lot and, and what Huckleberry is able to do um, is really fantastic, but it's a drop in the bucket. So I'll, I'll touch on where we're headed next, but we wanted to share some of the lessons of what we've learned. And I don't, I mean, there, there are many and this slide doesn't capture them all, but I think really from, you know, a campus perspective, training, training, and more training. I mean, it, it is continuous and making sure um, that your staff is bought in and understands why. Um, actually, as part of this process, we took many trips out uh, to the landfill and um, continue to do so and to um, Huckleberry, the Invessel units, so people could understand why. Because where we live in New Hanover County, it's, you know, coastal, it's really flat. The landfill is actually, it's like a mountain. It's the highest point of elevation in the county. So it's an impactful experience. And ironically, I, you know, I still have sometimes staff say, when are we going back to the landfill? Um, so, you know, making sure people are bought in and then they understand what and why. Um, signage is really helpful for when you're not there to answer any questions. Um, making sure that you're really understanding the accessibility of where your trash, where your recycling, and where your composting is. Um, and then really beyond um, that, you know, at Aramark, we have an entire food management process. So we really look at everything from the beginning to the end. So, you know, we're, we're tracking on this. We're looking up opportunities upstream to prevent um, food waste. And we're also looking at other avenues um, for diversion along the food waste hierarchy. So at UNCW, they also donate some scraps to a bird rescue. Um, they make donations for people through a partner, Good Shepherd. Um, so really lots of opportunities built around this program, but the ability to have compost that was not only accessible to UNCW, but also accessible to the public was huge. Um, and obviously uh, a lot of enthusiasm has paid off along the way. So as we look ahead, if we go to the next slide, um, we've really just continued to see the critical need to, to continue this diversion. Um, you know, where we live is coastal. So we do experience events like hurricanes. Um, and so, um, in 2018, we had Hurricane Florence, and, and at the time, um, you know, it really just took, gosh, Joe, was it like 25 years off of our landfill? Is that the right number? I don't want to misquote. Yeah. So, um, and, and it was a time between we were transitioning between um, the closing of one cell and the opening of a new cell. And so, you know, it's, it's helped us to highlight the effort when we can do big things like Huckleberry to remove waste from entering our landfill. Um, it, it's it's critically important. Um, you go to the next slide for me. Um, so you know where where we're at now is uh, we started with Wagner Dining Hall. Um, it is front of house and back of house, so uh, full full blown there. And then they've also added on an additional dining hall, the shore. Um, you know as Joe mentioned we've gotten quite creative on ways to divert waste with our community. We've done four years of an annual pumpkin drive that uh, really has just taken off. We started just doing after Halloween, but then we 
realized that people also still have tons of pumpkins and gourds after Thanksgiving. So we collect um, two times uh, a year for that. And then the really exciting news is uh, that Wilmington Compost Company, who is also a UNCW alumni, um, is actually about to hopefully get a second facility permitted in, um, in an adjacent county in Pender County. Um, so that'll really allow us to take the next step. And, you know, whereas at one point we were really trying to figure out like who and what and, you know, where waste could come, food waste could come from, you know, now we're at capacity at Huckleberry. So this gives us that uh, next step needed to continue to expand waste diversion, not only in our county, but in surrounding counties. All right, and so uh, that's it. And I'm, I'm not sure if we have time right now for questions, but um, if you do want to reach out to us, uh, if you don't have time to ask what you'd like to ask today, both of our email addresses, they're there. Um, and we love to talk compost, so. Great, thank you so much, Marie and Joe. And we had one question um, come in. I think you touched on it in that last couple of slides, Marie, about front of house and back of house. I, I think we have a couple minutes. If you wanna just expand a little bit, maybe on how that, did you start back of house and expand to front? If you wanna touch on that, you, you're welcome to. Yeah, well, the nice part about doing this in the dining hall is that both of those dining halls have dish returns. So we were able to do front of house and back of house all at once in the implementation. Um, you know, that can get pretty tr tricky. And that's why in that one slide where it was like training, 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 like the visuals and, and really taking time. And um, I don't like to use the word police thing, but like regularly like checking the bins just to make sure because those are teachable moments. And I, I think the last thing I would just say there is like when you can take pictures of contamination and use those as storytelling points, or, you know, sometimes if we did have struggles, we'd actually go out to Huckleberry and maybe look at like where a load had been dropped. And, and you know, we did this one time, we did a, a waste audit um, at the landfill and it's almost like a uh, compost CSI. If you can figure out where it came from and maybe you can go there and do a little bit more education or maybe they don't have the proper like bin at that uh, station. So um, it has not been without, you know, a lot of effort. I will put that, but uh, it is definitely possible. And, and so it's been really great. And I moved on to a corporate position. So I wasn't there for the implementation of the second um, dining hall, but, you know, they were able to also implement with both front and house, back of house, because they also had a dish return there. Great, thank you. Well, there's a couple of other questions coming in. We're gonna move on. And if y'all have a chance to visit the Q&A or if we have some time at the end, we can circle back around. But thank you so much for sharing. This is really great. I, I'm, um, I really love the story and I also love the partnership that you all have created down in Eastern North Carolina. It's just really remarkable. And we, um, we hear that partnership and collaboration theme more and more just about every meeting that I'm in and we talk about it a lot with Kirk and when we were at the North Carolina stakeholder meeting it was the theme of the day and so just really appreciate we have a lot to learn from you all so thank you for your time You're welcome thanks for having us all right all right well this time I'm going to introduce Briar Mills and Briar is a student with the University of Otago New Zealand um, we love to hear from students and hear all the exciting things um, that you have going on. And so we're just really thrilled to have you here sharing with us, Briar. Um, Briar is studying toward a master's of science in human nutrition at the University of Otago in Dundon, New Zealand. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, it's Dunedin. Dunedin, thank you. <laughs> um, her research is focused around food waste at the university's 14 residential colleges. So I will let you start um, and take it away, Blair. Th Briar, thank you. Perfect. I'll just share my slides. Is that all working? You can see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Um, so kia ora, my name is Briar Mills and I'm studying towards a Master of Science in Human Nutrition at the University of Otago. Today I'm going to be talking about the work we are doing with food waste. Um, I'll start with a bit of an introduction and then talk about food waste innovation, one of our research groups, and what we do followed by my work on food waste at our university. 
So the University of Otago is located in Otipoti, Dunedin in southern Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have approximately 21,000 students across over 200 subjects. Additionally, there are over 4,000 staff, including around 1,500 in academic and research roles. The university has a number of research themes, which are interdisciplinary groups of people who are carrying out related research in developing areas. Food waste innovation was established as a research theme in 2020. Food waste innovation has over 50 investigators, students and academics, working on food waste related research from a range of disciplines. Our research is divided into three sub themes. Social innovations is using behavioral science to understand the drivers responsible for food waste in order to make recommendations on minimization initiatives and testing solutions and pro providing impact analyses. Metrics and management is understanding how much food is being wasted, where it is being wasted, and its social, economic, and environmental impacts. Technical innovations is using the latest science and technology to make the most of the business opportunity that food waste provides. So we also have an upcycled food lab, and that sits across all of these sub-themes. We have identified upcycled food as a huge growth sector and are leading the charge in New Zealand, along with some upcycled food companies in this space. Here's a short video from the Upcycled Food Association explaining a bit more about what upcycled food is. Upcycled food is the easy way for anyone to prevent food waste with the products they buy. It takes otherwise wasted but perfectly good food items and upcycles it into higher valued, nutritious products that help everyday consumers prevent food waste. It's important to prevent food waste because preventing food waste is the most effective solution to climate change. Not only that, but 99% of people agree that food waste is a problem. And with upcycled food, we're giving everyday people the ability to participate in that solution with their purchases. I love when people ask for examples of upcycled products because the reality is they come in all shapes and sizes. We can make barley milk out of spent grain from beer brewing. We can make chips out of the pulp from juice manufacturing. We can take the cacao fruit from chocolate manufacturing and turn it into a fruit paste. We can even take those day old pastries, ferment the sugars and turn it into a vodka. Or take underloved, undervalued fruits and vegetables to create pet treats. Upcycle Food Association is a nonprofit dedicated to preventing food waste by accelerating the upcycled economy. We don't produce upcycled products of our own. Instead, we are a coalition of hundreds of businesses across dozens of countries working together to create sustainable solutions for our food system. With Upcycle Certified, we are certifying ingredients and products to give consumers confidence that when they purchase an upcycled product, they're having impact on food waste prevention. Upcycled certified products can be found in all the places where you already shop, both online and in a grocery store. Look for the Upcycled Certified logo on packaging, and together we can address climate change by preventing food waste. Sorry, something funny happened there. No? There we go. Awesome. Um, so in our upcycled food lab, we have food scientists who work with industry partners to develop new products using food or byproducts that would otherwise go to waste. Some examples of things people can make can use at home include a recipe to make home brew beer using stale bread and a spent grain cake using spent, group spent brewer's grain. We also have behavioural scientists looking at consumer perceptions of upcycled food. Food Waste Innovation is a member of the Upcycled Food Association 
and brings together researchers at the University of Otago and industry partners to provide a range of services from research and consultancy to food product development. Sorry, my slides have been a little bit funny. Um, I was having that same problem, Briar. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if it's something to do with having the video in there or quite what's happened. But. So I, I was able to end up leaving it out of slideshow mode and just choosing the slides on the left. Okay, I'll try doing that and you guys If you have just... to, you might have to do that. That that worked for me. <laughs> okay. Um, I've just got my speaker notes down the bottom. So if you guys <laughs> could look at the slides and I'll use my speaker notes. <laughs> um, so food waste innovation operates with a number of important relationships. It's an interdisciplinary research group. So while there are a large number of food scientists associated with the theme, there are also researchers from a range of other fields, including human nutrition, botany, sociology, marketing, geography, and chemistry. Additionally, the theme has associate investigators from external organizations, such as other universities in New Zealand and industry groups. By bringing together people with a wide range of expertise, food waste innovation is able to work together, share ideas and resources, and achieve optimal outcomes. Food waste innovation works with many different industry groups, such as companies with waste for upcycled food development, government departments, food rescues, and other entities. By engaging with many different partners, including offering services such as industry consultancy, food waste innovation is able to make essential progress in the fight against food waste. Um, so in addition to the Upcycled Food Lab, there are many other pieces of research being carried out by food waste innovation team members, looking at all different parts of the food supply chain, including production, households and consumers, and in my case, at tertiary institutes. My Master of Science project fits under the metrics and management sub-theme of food waste innovation and is centred around an audit of food waste at our residential colleges at the University of Otago. The University of Otago houses over 3,500 students across 14 residential colleges, 10 of which are owned by the university and four which are independently owned but formally affiliated with the university. The student residents are provided with three meals a day, buffet style, provided, um, prepared and provided by the kitchen staff. Despite the large quantities of food that the colleges deal with on a daily basis, there is currently no measurement of food waste both from plates and from the kitchens. Measurement is an important part of food waste reduction. After all, what gets measured gets managed. However, Otago lacks regular measurement of food waste. My project hopes to set a baseline for food waste measurement at Otago and in Aotearoa at tertiary institutes. Here at Otago, we have landfill reduction targets, but no way of tracking food waste progress. My work will enable future initiatives to be put in place and progress to be monitored, as well as helping Otago progress to meet SDG 12.3. Over the course of a month, I visited each college on two weekdays and one weekend day. I sorted and weighed preparation waste, buffet waste and plate waste from breakfast, lunch and dinner. The waste was sorted into as distinct categories as possible to allow for in-depth analysis. Both edible and inedible, and avoidable and unavoidable food was measured. The method followed was developed based on the food loss and waste accounting and reporting standard to ensure high quality data comparable to other studies. While I haven't conducted in-depth analysis yet, I can share some preliminary results from the audit. On average, around 150 to 200 grams of food is wasted per student per day, with approximately three and with approximately 3,500 students, that's over 500 kilometers uh, kilograms per day across the colleges. At most of the colleges, the majority of the waste is plate waste. However, at some colleges, patterns of high buffet waste were noted. 
Additionally, the four university affiliated colleges have kitchens that operate differently from the 10 university owned colleges. One aspect of this is different suppliers. So while the university owned colleges purchase items such as pre-peeled potatoes or grated carrots, the university affiliated colleges may purchase more whole ingredients leading to more prep waste. So while my data may suggest there was little prep waste, it is important to take into account that not everything was captured in the audit. Following the audit, focus groups were held at three residential colleges to gain insight into food waste behaviours, as well as discuss possible ideas for interventions. Groups were held with staff and students, meaning there were a range of viewpoints shared, as well as discussions around the feasibility of possible initiatives. My research, particularly the methodology from my audit, is transferable to other food service applications. Food Waste Innovation is currently consulting for a nationwide aged care provider in New Zealand to help them understand their food waste and potential interventions. We are also currently applying for government funding to replicate the project to cover the entire aged care sector in New Zealand, which includes over 50,000 people receiving food service. Another student project is consulting for the Dunedin Hospital to help them understand their food waste to inform a waste strategy for a new hospital currently being built. The methodology I developed and used will be used for both of these projects as the model of food service is very similar. This is just one example of the benefits of our research group working together on solving food waste problems. While my audit data sets a baseline for food waste measurement at Otago, there are already a number of initiatives in place to help minimise food waste and reduce waste to landfill. Most colleges have had trays removed from the dining rooms to reduce plate waste. Many of the plates have also been downsized to, to prevent overfilling. The colleges used to have slightly smaller lunch plates and larger dinner plates, but they moved to using lunch plates at both meals to help the students take appropriate portion sizes. The university owned colleges also partake in Mindful Mondays, implemented by the university's sustainability office. One part of this is sustainable extras, where leftovers from meals on previous days, when safe and when safe, are reheated and reserved. At one of the residential colleges, a commercial digester has been installed. It is still in the early days of implementation with ongoing trialing before deciding whether or not to roll it out across the university. Leftovers from events are provided to students through the student association. And there are also a, small, a number of small scale compost heaps around our campus. Other outcomes of my work are to develop new initiatives looking further up the waste hierarchy than composting in trying to reduce the excess food in the first place. Ideas have been voiced such as fridges with leftovers that students can access in the evening after dinner time, as well as measurement and tracking of food waste that students can be involved with. We are also in the early stages of designing a rating system for scoring the college dining rooms and kitchens on their food waste behaviours, which would be able to be rolled out across the university and perhaps more widely to help the colleges make the best decisions. In addition to the audit, I also carried out some work earlier in the year, looking at food waste in all of Aotearoa New Zealand's tertiary institutes. By interviewing sustainability representatives, I was able to gain insight into what is going on around the country. I compiled this into a report, which has been shared with the participants, allowing ideas to be shared. Collaborations like this are important for our work and enable productive working relationships. By reusing ideas and sharing what has and hasn't worked, more progress is able to be made in the higher education food waste space. So in summary, food waste innovation has many components, all of which important relationships with organizations and companies, all of which involve important relationships with organizations and companies working in the food waste space. Partnership and teamwork have led to many innovative outputs since food waste innovations establishment just over two years ago and will hopefully lead to many more in the future. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today. This is my contact email address and the email address and website for food waste innovation if you'd like to get in touch. Nā mihi nui kia koutou katoa.
Thank you so much, Briar. We really appreciate you being here. It's always really um, inspiring to hear from students. And um, that's the most important part of all our jobs, our students. And it's just really great to, to know that you all are carrying the torch and continuing this work. Um, so really, really appreciate you. Um, we'll open it up now for questions. If you have questions for Briar or for Joe and Marie at this time, we can open up um, conversation and you can place those in the chat. Or if you um, would like to unmute and ask the question, I think it's okay for you to do that as well at this time. Um, I, I'll ask one question here that's come in, Briar. Um, for you, is there support from communities and government or are universities and colleges leading the way in research and implementation? And that, that may be for you and Marie and Joe as well. Um, so I think in, in New Zealand and the government side of things, we have um, our prime minister's chief science advisor who um, compiles reports and things on topics interesting um, to the prime minister about pressing science topics and the office of the Prime Minister's Chief Science Advisor is currently doing lots of work on food waste um, and they're compiling some reports so they've come and visited us but they're going to be publishing their reports over the next couple of years I think and it's really um, increasing awareness and hopefully increasing government support as well um, here in Aotearoa yeah. Thank you. And and Joe and Marie, would y'all like to touch on that as well? I think um, certainly pretty telling that you're here from local government, Joe. So um, if you want to touch on that question as well, I think it'd be great. Sure. I, I guess the to answer that question, it depends on where you are. If, if you're in a community or a state or a county that um, is populated by folks who believe that you know, composting is is an important part of um, you know our, our our efforts to reduce waste, diverse divert waste away from landfills. Um, absolutely, we, I'm I'm really lucky in that um, for the last ten years, I've had a board of county commissioners that have been very very supportive of our efforts and a very progressive university system right here in town that that's also supportive of these type of waste diversion and reuse efforts so um i'm very blessed to have that situation unfortunately it's not the case in every particular um municipality or or, or state but uh, I think Marie would back me up on this it all starts with the grassroots i mean even if you're in the most um uh, negative type of environment. If if you get enough grassroots efforts, where uh, you know, for example, students are 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 driving that need, you know, eventually they'll come around. I, I really believe that. Thank you. Um, another question that was posed that I think um, y'all may be able to speak to, Briar. You might as well. Um, and this question is about residence hall kitchens, particularly. Um, do any of you have any recommendations for composite machines for residence hall kitchens? And Briar, I think that you mentioned that um, there's a digester at one of the residence halls in, um, in the university there. And I'm not sure if you know much about that system, if you want to share that. Um, yeah, so earlier this year, one of our halls of residence did get a um, digester installed and I know a little bit about it but it's very much still in the trial phase um, it's pretty new and getting tested out so yeah we don't have too much um, and I, I don't know details about it to share but yeah it's there and it's it's a work in progress. Yeah we on um, at Airmark partner with Orca and EcoVim um but I am not, I'm, I'm actually in the process of learning a lot more about that, but I, you know, I think we've been looking at like some smaller scale, even than what they might provide, but I'm still learning a lot. So I don't have a recommendation yet, but I think there's a lot of opportunity in that space, it's particularly, you know, if you don't have the great facility like we have here, but if you, you have some space you can dedicate to that. And you have staff, I guess that's the other thing I would just point out that you want to make sure that you have 
people that are invested and, and would make sure that it would uh, you know operate and because the last thing you want to do is invest that much money and then see it fail. Yeah. Um, this is a question um, for Joe and Marie about Huckleberry of accepting compostable plastics and other packaging. Um, what challenges have you seen if you are accepting it um, due to the different types of compostable food service wear? Yeah, so, um, you know, on our website and in our education and outreach materials, we we um, state that we will accept BPI certified compostable material. And very early on in our testing, we found that it, it completely breaks down in, in the three days that it's in the in-vessel unit. Um, we have had some situations where folks think things are compostable where they're really not. Um, and, you know, luckily we have a screen at the tail end of the device to, to filter out that type of material, but uh, contamination, uh, you know, with a good screen and, and good education on the front end, I think is the key, but uh, no, no issues at all uh, with, with packaging that is designed to be compostable. Thank you. Um, Linda shared from U.S. Composting Council a link in the chat just for everybody, um, an equipment guide that the Composting Council um, provides. And so um, for whoever asked that question, if you want to go in there, it looks like they have some good information to share about equipment. Um, Briar, this question is for you. Um, how has the student reaction been to Mindful Monday meals? Um, there's, there's been a bit of mixed reaction and it's something that's come up a bit in my focus groups um it's yeah some students are really on board others are a bit more hesitant um but the colleges are working around it so for example some students are quite opposed to not having meat because that's part of the mindful monday so um often the sustainable extras will be incorporated into that and um there might be leftover um beef casserole or something so that will be provided the next night so there are um meat options but it's still considered mindful um so yeah there's there's been a bit of mixed reaction but I think um on the whole I think it's going to keep happening because it's um yeah working reasonably well great thank you um I wanted to um say thanks to Corey Berman from the University of Vermont um is our behind the scenes. Um, so you can't see Corey, but he's um, checking in with uh, the chat and making sure that things run smoothly. So thank you so much, Corey. And, and he just um, updated. So the um, link that Linda shared was to the host and panelist and Corey just put that out to everyone. So everybody now should be able to see that link. Um, so thank you again, Corey, for being behind the scenes. Um, Marie, could you talk more about the training and getting everyone on board with composting? Were there complaints and how did you address these? So, you know, initially training was a lot uh, of just going and having in-person conversations um, and a lot with, uh, you know, getting the dish room, you know, direct contact with the dish room staff. Um, then we created some signage boards. At first we had some that were printed materials. Um, and then for a while we went with some that actually had the products on them. And that seems to be the best visual identification. Um, we uh, partner with Eco Products as our preferred abnormally, um, environmental disposable provider. So you know, they also can provide support. They have um, regional product and zero waste specialists. And um, the, if you purchase eco products, they also can design customized signage for your location. Um, so that's really helpful. And then also um, training with management staff too. So that when, you know, I couldn't be there that they could also be helping to like check for contamination and have those conversations. Um, you know, in food service, a lot of times in pre-shift or pre-service, we'll, we'll do huddles. So those are really great opportunities. Um, and then, you know, uh, at this location, people have to clock in and, and clock out. So um, the space by the time clock is also another great place to, um, 
encourage people to put, you know, if things are going really well, post some numbers about diversion, um, and then also address some of the issues. Um, so that were, were, would be where we would post pictures. Um, I mean, I think in terms of complaints, I think probably the hardest thing is, is supply chain and just struggling through that because, you know, it goes back to that compostable product um, question earlier. Uh, we had a little bit of fits and starts, like getting exactly what we needed. And then, of course, now we're in a whole different supply chain issue. And I'm, I'm sure those same challenges still prevail. Um, and some products can look so similar. And so, you know, that type of training really is like working with the people that you're receiving in your inventory and like if you don't get the right product like you might need to have the conversations with the Cisco's and the U.S. Foods of the world like sometimes they will substitute other things um but at the end of the day you know you do have to serve people food and if you have to use disposables it, it can get a little tricky um but I'm hopeful you know we, we continue to move in a, in a more positive space when it comes to sorting all of that out. Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you again, Joe, Marie, and Briar for sharing today um, and being a part of the day with us at Kirk, especially right here before the holidays. Um, thank you, Linda and U.S. Composting Council for the sponsorship. Um, if you look in the chat, everyone who's attending, um, Kirk is in the process of an annual uh, annual survey. Um, and we really love everyone's feedback. So um, if you could visit that and take some time to, um, to do that survey, um, we would really appreciate it. And I'm gonna quickly share um, my screen again, just for some upcoming information I wanna share with you all. Um, So Kirk has a members meeting coming up next year, January 26, 2023 um, at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is for members or if you're interested in just hearing about Kirk, um, membership to Kirk is a free membership. And so you could join Kirk on that day and um, learn more about all the great things that are going on. Um, the webinar series happens every year. There are six webinars in the series. The first one in 2023 will be coming up in February, so you can um, be on the lookout for that. Um, you can visit kirk3r.org for recordings for this. Um, you'll, you'll be able to access the presentation um, and past recordings of the webinar series, as well as presentations from years past. Um, and if anybody's interested in sharing about your um, great things that you have going on at your schools, you know, we really want to hear that that type of stuff. And so um, we have a um, proposal form that you can um, fill out online if you're interested in sharing a little bit about some of the work that you're doing and you would like to um, share. So um, there's that. I'm going to pop the panel slides up just for a few more minutes. Just make sure everybody has that information, names and contact information for each of our panelists. And any um, last minute, um, let's see, we may have one last minute question. I think we covered that one. Um, Corey, any last minute things for you, for Kirk, before we um, end for the day? No, I don't, Jim, but I just want to extend my thanks to you for hosting this last webinar of the year. We had a great, successful year of webinars, and as you mentioned, they're all on our Kirk website, so please check that out. A lot of great resources there, and again, I know we posted a link to the uh, the, uh, the survey, but please take the time and take the survey. It really helps us inform the direction we take in terms of offering webinars and other educational information, so we really appreciate the time, and thanks again to our panelists uh, all across the, the world joining us today, which is great. Thank you, Briar coming to us from New Zealand. Yeah, thank you so much. Hope you all have a wonderful holiday season and we will see you all next year. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Jen. Thank you, Leanna. Good. Hope you all back, have a great- Back in your old seat. <laughs> I know. Thanks for letting me be here. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> <laughs>
I hope y'all have a great holiday season and um, lovely time with your families. And thanks. You too. Bye, everybody. Yeah, same to you. Thanks, Bye, everyone. Thanks, Corey. Bye, all. Thank See you, Corey.